member of the Bio3 department, but I wanted to uh, introduce Jennifer Galovich, who is from the math department. But she has been heavily involved in a little bit of biology for the last number of years. So she's taken 10 years. <laughs> uh, a number, she sat in on a number of, of the courses here, um, and so has trained herself in bio and just spent a year sabbatical out in Virginia um, doing some modeling and some work with bacteria and mathematics. So she is here to talk about some of her um, research that she did on her sabbatical on E. coli and the tryptophan Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, as I have dragged Barb to a bunch of <laughs> conferences that they say you need, in order to go to this, you need a mathematician and a biologist. So um, <laughs> we've been a good crew, right? We, we we're a good partner. <coughs> yeah. So again, thank you for coming. Special thanks to my neuroscience support group. I see a bunch of you in the in the audience. So um, as Barb said, yes, I spent my sabbatical at the Virginia Bioinformatics Institute, which is associated with Virginia Tech, in, uh, in a corner of Virginia that you didn't really know existed, <laughs> the, the sort of tail. Um, it's a beautiful part of the world, and we, we took advantage of that. But I was within, in a terrific lab there, and um, it was actually, I got started on this at a conference that Barb and I had gone to at Sweetbriar um, in a different part of Virginia. Um, oh gosh, three years ago, I think it is, three years ago. Um, and one of the speakers at that conference was Reinhard Lauenbacher. And I was really engaged in the kind of modeling he was doing and said, gee, you know, did anyone ever spend a sabbatical with you? And he said, oh yeah, and handed me his card. And since I was coming up for sabbatical, that I, uh, when the time came, I called him and he said, we're welcome to come. And so there I was. So um, on a previous sabbatical, I had spent a lot of time developing, and then later when I came back, teaching a course, um, which you guys haven't been in, but because um, we haven't done it for a while, but of course, in an introduction to bioinformatics, which was cross-listed with uh, with bio, and I was um, really engaged in, in developing this course and learning about uh, basically phylogenetics and um, molecular evolution was really the basis of that course. And so students got you know pretty interested in it and wanted to do research. And then I realized that I'd never done any research in these areas. So I'm not exactly plausible as a mentor for this. So I thought, OK, I need to get my hands dirty with some real, with some real research. And I was, so that's what, that's kind of what brought me here. OK, now I turn this thing in the wrong direction. Let's see. OK, so I wanted to begin by talking a little bit about mathematical modeling and then the kind I'm doing, and then in particular, the, the project I was working on. So to begin with, this is, we have a division here. Uh, molecular biologists, biology as seen by mathematicians. So this is what Reagan's molecular genetics course looked like to me some days. Um, signal transduction cascades and a bazillion crazy pictures. Uh, it was it was one of those courses was a good thing, thing there was about 100 feet of blackboard because you'd start the signal transduction cascade here and then it would just keep on going forever. Okay, on the other hand, mathematics is seen by biologists. Okay, so we all have our crazy notation and pictures and it feels in both cases like a private language. So. Part of my last 10 years has been, been spent trying to demystify that for myself. So looking for some common ground, what is, so I want to talk about what is mathematical modeling in the context of biology? Who cares? What good is it? What can we, what can we learn from this? And so to illustrate that, I want to give some examples. So what kind of questions do biologists ask that mathematicians might be helpful with? Well, you're looking at whole systems and 
often networks within those, within those systems, and how does the behavior of the whole system relate to the structure of um, some kind of a network? In particular, if you have a really complicated system, can you bust it up into smaller pieces that you could understand that are acting as regulators? So for example, signal transduction, gene regulation, these are, these are um, important examples of this kind of question. And the claim is that mathematical models can give us some insight. What kinds of insight? Well, we can provide some approximate descriptions of systems that let us examine the system structure and properties. We can take this as a sort of virtual laboratory see what happens if you change this input and what, what does the model say will happen. So you, don't, you can do that in the laboratory, but it's expensive and time consuming. Why not do it in this virtual laboratory that the mathematical model provides? So what happens when you dink around with it? And you know, maybe the mathematics will tell you what you might expect. In particular, you might generate some interesting questions or guesses, or what we call them in science, hypotheses, educated guesses, about what might happen, and then suggest ways that we might design some experiments or clinical studies to actually test this, test these ideas. So the general picture is this. You start with the math, and this isn't the pointer, but I'm pointing here, okay? the mathematical model, <coughs> and then you run it. This provides some kind of simulation of the biological system from which maybe you predicted something, and now you're gonna go into the lab and run some experiments and see whether or not this validates your model. Does your model make a prediction? When you go into the lab, is that what happens? Maybe, maybe not. But what happens then is you come back and you, you fool around with the model and say, well, the, the laboratory experiments suggest, nah, maybe not quite. So we're going to adjust the mathematical model, run the simulation, predict again, and, and it just keeps going around in a, in a circle until you get some kind of stability. And the mathematical model and the validation are now um, in, the same, uh, in the same place. So that's the goal. So when you're designing a model, what do you want to do? Well, you hope that you can capture the basic biological behavior of the system. Biologists are really looking at this, okay, based on a number of courses I've taken, <laughs> this fire hose of details that um, you're trying to sort out, and sometimes it's difficult to step back and see the forest for the trees. And in a way, this is what the mathematics idea is going to do, try to capture the basic biological behavior of the system. Maybe not all the details, but the basics. In a hope to simulate, remember that was the second step, to simulate the system responses to stimuli and robustness to noise. So what there's stuff that doesn't really matter does the system still does the does the system still respond the way it should? Okay, so noise is, is stuff that happens that really shouldn't affect the system, but you, know, you want to see what you want to see what really matters. What counts as noise and what really counts as if you like signal? And you hope that you can rep reproduce some key overall properties like long-term behavior. Does this thing settle down? Is it stable? Does it oscillate? What happens in the long run? So bat mathematical models come in two basic flavors, qual quantitative models and qualitative models. And for many years, quantitative models have been the ones that most people think of when we, they talk about mathematical models in biology. They give detailed quantitative output and predictions. But the downside is, in order to get detailed output, you have to have detailed input. 
You have to have a complete understanding of the enzyme kinetics. You need to know all the parameters. You need to know the, the chemistry up one side and down the other. Sometimes that's really hard to get at. Estimating the parameters can be really, can be really difficult. But when that's been done, we produce these differential equations models. So they tell us how things are changing um, as with respect to time as various kinds of inputs in the uh, or variables in the model change. So differential equations models are looking at things that are changing in a continuous way and uh, require a significant amount of uh, calculus um, and linear algebra here to understand. Qualitative models, on the other hand, give us qualitative output. And so, um, so such as these long-term behavior kinds of questions. And so we only need qualitative input, like you know, who, who affects who? You know, who? Who leans on what to make what happen? So you don't necessarily need to have all of those quantitative details to give a qualitative description. So there are trade-offs, of course. There are trade-offs, of course. You, you may really need that quantitative output, in which case you're going to have to labor diligently in the biological vineyard and the mathematical vineyard to come up with those, with those uh, parameters to, to get it. Um, however, the um, Again, the mathematics there is not so accessible to biologists who may have chosen biology as a field um, and not, are not maybe so interested in exploring the mathematics deeply. So it can be not so accessible to understand what those models are about. Qualitative models, however, are really accessible to biologists. And Laubenbacher's lab, the lab I was visiting, this was their main goal in life, to develop qualitative models that would be accessible and usable by biologists. This would be the point. Um, and so there are varieties of those, just things called Boolean models. I'll tell, tell you a little, little bit about what that is in a minute polynomial dynamical systems, something called petri nets, agent-based models. So these are all names of discrete models where instead of thinking about things changing continuously in time, we're thinking about things in discrete steps. Okay. So the standard approach would be figure out who's on the stage. Who are the actors? Who are the agents? For example, certain genes or types of cells or populations. And then figure out how are they talking to each other? What are the reactions and the interactions? For example, genes are upregulated or downregulated. Cells take up iron, say, or secrete it. Populations increase or decrease. Then you want to describe those interactions mathematically. And as I said before, the traditional, the historic way of doing that is involve differential equations, the quantitative approach. But I'm here to tell you about another way, okay? The qualitative approach describing the, how things change discreetly in steps rather than in um, using something called a transition table instead of using this differential equation. So let's look at a really simple example to illustrate what I'm talking about. We have a system that has two genes. One of them is X and one of them is Y. And they're either on or off. Right? If they're on, we'll call it one. If it's off, we'll call it zero. And we're going to look at discrete time steps. We've got the state of the system at some particular time. And then we're going to see what does it look like at the next so, oops, there we go. So X is the boring gene. If it's off, it stays off. If it's on, it stays on. The Y gene is a little bit more interesting. And here are the rules for the Y gene. If both X and Y are on, then 
y turns off. If either x or y is off, then y turns off. Okay, so here's a table that's meant to summarize that. Remember, one is off, zero is off. As one is on, zero is off. What I said there. So, x is the boring gene. If it's off, then the next time it's still off. <coughs> okay. And if it's on, then the next time it's still on. Now let's look at y. Okay. If both x and y are on, if they're both on now, then remember x stays on but y turns off. And if either one of them is off, so that would be these two lines. If either one of them is off, then y turns on. Are you with me? You follow what the table is telling you on and on? So I have just taken these rules. I've taken the rules and put them in a table. This, the first part of the table, these first two columns are telling us What's going on with x and y right now? The second two columns are saying, according to these rules, what is going to be the state of the system next time? Okay. So you can also draw a picture. Oh, maybe not. What did I do? I broke it. <laughs> so this picture says, you know, x, wherever it is, it stays where it is. But that x has an influence on y. Knowing what x is has an influence on y. Okay. I guess this thing just, I'll just do it from here. Okay, so we want to know what happens in the long run. Well, if they're both off, then remember x stays off. Y turns on and stays on, okay? So that's what's happening here. They're both off, X stays off and Y stays on, and now that, now it's stuck, right? It's just gonna repeat that situation. If they're both on, okay, then X stays on and Y stay, turns off. So these are in the order of X, Y. But if x is on and y is off, then x stays on and y turns on. And so now they're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So this kind of situation is called a fixed point. You can see why. If eventually the system is, starts off someplace and wanders around according to its rules, and then it gets stuck someplace forever, that's a fixed point. But often, as you know, in biology, we have things that look more like oscillations. It goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And so this is called, in mathematics, a limit cycle. And how long it is, is it how many states are involved, in this case, just two. Okay, so these are the kinds of questions <laughs> you might ask about <coughs> something more interesting than this x and y. Okay. So, at the meeting that Barb and I were at in Sweetbriar, what we learned about and actually did a project on um, was looking at a model like this of the lack operon. Your old friend from bio one, what's the number now? 121? 121. Okay. And so I thought, well, what's the next thing you do after the lack operon? You do the trip operon. You all remembered that, right? Okay, you're supposed to nod here. <laughs> right. Okay. So I asked Reinhardt and I said, well, you know, the lack operon was done by actually one of his students. Um, and, um, you know, all that stuff been published in well known, surely somebody's done the trip operon. No, this had not been done. At least we couldn't find anything in the literature. So I thought, okay. Well, I want to learn how this process works. So I'm going to pick something. I'm going to pick the trip off one because this is really well 
understood. Okay. Just not really well understood by me yet. Okay. All right. So just let me remind you a little bit of, of uh, in case there are people in the audience who haven't um, been through Pi 121, the whole idea of an operon was first described by Jacob Monod in the early 1960s, and I just learned that Jacob just died last April, and well into my city, into his 90s. So the Nobel in 1965 was that the outcome of that. <coughs> and in general, an operon is some segment of DNA that includes a promoter, an operator, and a bunch of structural genes that are, in general, all controlled together, and transcription produces this polycystronic mRNA. Okay, and you will remember that operons also come in two flavors. We have the inducible operon, where basically the default is that it's off, and in the presence of an inducer that binds to the promoter, flips the switch, the operon is turned on. Classic example is the lab operon. The other flavor of operon is the repressible operon, where the default is that it's on. And in the presence of a repressor that bonds to the promoter, the flip flips the switch the other direction, it's turned on. And the classic example of this is the tryptophan. So what's tryptophan? It's an essential amino acid. Humans can't make this, but E. coli can, which is a good thing, because that's where I, what I was going to study. Um, it's synthesized, I didn't have the whole biosynthetic pathway here, but it's synthesized from porous mate. And what you need to know is that there are five genes that encode five enzymes, okay, that do this, that do this business. And these five genes form this single transcriptional unit, the, the tryptophan. Now, the tryptophan is interesting mathematically and biologically because it has three negative feedback loops. Repression, attenuation, and feedback inhibition. So, what I had to do was read, Tom can tell you, a stack of papers like this. And there's a two volume about a thousand pages each um, that's in everything you ever wanted to know about E. coli. <laughs> the Cold Spring Harbor, this, all these papers, it's sort of the Bible, uh, the E. coli Bible. And that's definitely, so they're both you know, in that. And um, so I read papers in that, I read all these papers from the literature, trying to figure out, trying to understand how does this thing work, okay? I needed to know, remember, who are the players? Who are the players and how do they talk to each other? So, repression. So here's a picture of repression. I'm not psychologically <laughs> repressed, but here. Okay, so upstream from this operon is, a, is another operon that we're called trip R that um, produces this monomer. And uh, you get an inactive dimer, but in the presence of tryptophan, it activates this repressor. <coughs> okay, so then the repressor blocks the RNA poly polymerase from doing its thing. Okay, so you don't get any transcription as long as you've got plenty of tryptophan around. Because plenty of tryptophan means that it's going to bind to that active repressor and block transcription. Okay. At the other end, feedback inhibition, okay, if this um, trip E, remember there's E, D, C, B, A, and trip E is the key one. All of the literature seems to support that. Um, and it's the first one, as you can see, uh, and it's called enthranolate synthetase. And um, if you've got, if, it actually forms a, with D, it forms a heterotetramer. But um, the deal here, again, is that if you've got too much tryptophan, instead of, so here you've got this R, uh, mRNA transcript, and you think it would just 
go off merrily about its business and make more tryptophan. But if you got too much tryptophan around, the system says, no, we've got too much. We're not going to, you know, we're going to inactivate this enzyme and say, well, you're here, but sorry, you don't get to make any more tryptophan because we've already got the lift. Okay. So there's this feedback inhibition. So if there's too much tryptophan around, if there's an excess, then, then we're going to inactivate this enzyme that otherwise would feed into the biosynthetic biosynthesis. Now, here's the core. Attenuation. I had never heard of it. You didn't cover this. <laughs> um, it regulates transcription using translation. How cool is that? Is biology wonderful over there? So in pro prokaryotes, translation and transcription are happening pretty much at the same time. And attenuation takes advantage of this phenomenon. So what we want to focus on is this leader region here. And here's a close-up of the leader region. Basically, it comes in, there are four pieces of it. And in the first chunk, at about positions, I'm trying to remember, 12, 13, 14, somewhere around there, are two trip colors <coughs> sitting there in that first region. And they're the only one. They're the only ones in the region. And here's what can happen, and I'll show you a picture in a second. Sections one and two are capable of making a hairpin. Sections two and three are capable of making a hairpin. Sections three and four are capable of making a hairpin. But here's the deal. If you make one and two, then you get to make three and four. And three and four is a signal that says, halt, no transcription. Okay. So, if you, however, if you could make one sort of go on vacation for a while and let two, three form, then transcription proceeds. So this is the cool thing. And how does this happen? Well, if you've got, <coughs> let's look at this one first. If you've got plenty, or enough anyway, trip around, then, the, then what's going to happen? So you've got plenty of charged tRNA, trip charged tRNA. It's going to come in, land on that, on that, where those codons are. It'll make the one, two hairpin. Then the three, four hairpin will happen. And the whole thing falls apart. You, you, get, you get the translation. The termination hairpin forms. And the ribosome falls off. We're done. How, if you, if, if, if this, there's not, not trickling. If it's starved, then what's happening? Well, the ribosome is just sitting around, waiting. Oh, would you guys please show up? Okay, it's waiting for that tryptophan, and there's not much of it. So maybe it has to wait a while to show up. In the meantime, what's happening? The 2 3 anti termination hairpin is forming. So, transcription. So here's the general picture. We have repression. We have <coughs> the enzyme inhibition. Here, here this picture has shows it as the heterotetramer with the DNA to get, that get, um, that get blocked if the little, the little purple tryptophans lock in. <coughs> we have the feedback inhibition. But we also, we also have this attenuation idea going on. So my job was to figure out how all of this was going to fit together. So my model was something called a stochastic discrete polynomial dynamical system. You don't need to know anything more about that. <coughs> I'll tell you where the stochastic comes in in a minute. But, Remember the 
first step was to identify who were the players. So as far as I was concerned, I centered in on mRNA, intracellular tryptophan, and E, which was the dominating enzyme, the enthranolate synthase. I could, could never determine. Some people called it synthase, and some said synthetase, and I don't know if it makes any difference. But those were the guys, M, T, and E. And then I needed to describe the reactions and the interactions. So I fooled around with this for a while, but it seemed to me that the simplest, most straightforward model would be to assume that the mRNA and the enzyme were either there or not there. Okay? So this is called Boolean. It's either on or off, there or not there. But because of the attenuation stuff going on, it seemed that, and based on the literature, it seemed that I really needed to look at more than just tryptophan is there or it's not. I needed to look at some kind of gradation of it. You know, it's starvation level, there's way too much, or it's somewhere in between. So because I, um, <coughs> strictly Boolean, I needed something a little bit mathematically more complicated. But then I spent a lot of time constructing one of those tables, just like we saw before with the zeros and ones, only mine had zeros and ones and twos. And for every state of the system, I needed to figure out what was going to happen next. Okay, so that was my job, trying to reading through the literature, trying to understand what would, um, what would happen next. What did anybody already know about this? And, and then what could I predict? Okay. So then the next case was to um, run the model using the software that had been developed in the novel markers lab. Now, because there were only three variables, I really wouldn't have needed software. I wanted to learn the software, so I, so I used it. And what I expected, and what existing differential equations models suggested, was that there would be a fixed point steady state. That no matter where you started, eventually it would lock in something. that I made here, 
And with a 50-50 chance of obeying the rules, this is what it looked like. Okay. So I got a fixed, I got a fixed point for the enzyme, and the other stuff seems to be kind of an oscillation. Right. Now mathematical models predict that negative feedback should result in oscillations. So I, you know, I thought this was maybe not such a bad idea. But okay, so here I made my model. I've simulated what's going on. The next thing is to see what does the literature say is going to happen. Okay, so um, <coughs> So I looked at the, the literature. Minovsky and Horn had done these experiments, these deep repression experiments. So what they did was grow up these bacteria with a diet rich in tryptophan. That would shut down the oxygen, right? Okay. And then they switched them, they, they switched them to starvation diet. Okay? So they got all the tryptophan they ever wanted, and then, oh, no, no more. Okay. Now, how did they respond? Well, um, the picture on the left is showing the results from Minovsky and Horn, and I've highlighted the one that's looking at wild type. The other two were, were um, other mutants that they were looking at in, in this experiment, but I was interested in what was going on with the wild type. And, you know, kind of looks like a steady state. Right? And um, a I think that Lewis was a student of Yanofsky's. And um, he, now you'll notice that over here that the only thing that um, Yanofsky and Horn were measuring was the enzyme. Okay? And that was what I got as a steady state. All right, so this, is, this feels like good news. But they didn't measure the mRNA in the tree. So, who knows? Well, you know, Bliss did. Bliss did. At least he did the tryptophan. And, well, so he agrees with Horn that there is kind of a steady state there, but he also shows a steady state for the tryptophan, which doesn't really work. Well, I had been reading a bazillion papers, and there were these other things that Yanofsky and Horn and Bliss had done, they looked at mutants that removed feedback inhibition from the picture. You still have repression, you still have the attenuation, but these mutants didn't have any feedback inhibition. Now, what happens with Yanofsky and Horn? Well, it's a little hard to tell because there are not a whole lot of measurements there, but it looks, it looks like it's going to settle down. This is work show. So I revised my model. I said, okay, well, what would happen if I changed my model to match the experimental conditions that they were doing? I you removed feedback inhibition and I included something that I hadn't before, which was some kind of degradation of the enzyme. Okay, it's kind of slow, but I included that. And now what did I get? Everything's oscillating. So, so here I am. I'm trying to validate this with experiments, but the experiments <laughs> disagree with each other. Yanofsky and Horn seem to say that it, everything should be in a nice steady state. Bliss says, it wiggles up and down. People who looked at Bliss's work, so people who are doing those more detailed quantitative models um, over a series of about, oh, half a dozen papers in eight or nine years, finally managed to reproduce Bliss's oscillations in their differential equations models. But they also say, Nobody's been able, nobody has published any experimental validation of Bliss's oscillations. And Bliss, I googled like crazy, seems to have 
dropped off the face of the earth in California. I don't know. So, um, so there's no, so I, you know, I asked, if I went to a conference full of, full of microbiologists and asked them, nobody could, you know, they said, well, the list didn't take enough time points, so maybe that's, you know, maybe if you had more time points, you could see it. But, so I looked, you know, that was, that Yanofsky and Word paper was 94. We're talking like many years ago. Nobody seems to have repeated these experiments. So, so there I was. Um, so what I'd like to do next is, you know, I, my whole purpose in this was to remember to do my own research so that I could mentor undergraduate research. So, you are invited. Anyone who's interested who'd like to start with my model, rip it apart, critique it, fix it. What didn't I include that I ought to have? I have a large stack of papers you can read. <laughs> um, I didn't include time. There are all sorts of things that I could have included that I didn't include time delays. Try to estimate those probabilities better. Um, I, I, we could look at different sets of mutants. And, but you know what I'm really dying to do is repeat those experiments to see if 20 years later we could actually get more, get data that would tell us what, what really to expect. Um, or you could step into uncharted territory. Um, the Stadini only does this attenuation. Bezalus does something different with, with the trip kind of signal. So, you know, I don't know if you get the same kind of thing or not. Um, but, so, I would be excited to work on anybody who's interested in this. Now, um, <coughs> I have a little bit of time, so I want to show you some other, other kinds of things. As I said, you know, I picked something that was really well understood and pretty straightforward. So there's a mountain of literature that I could read, even though I didn't really find everything I wanted to there. Um, but I want to tell you some of the other kinds of things that this approach was being used for in the Mountain Bottoms lab. And there were three um, people, basically, working on different aspects of uh, the um, astrogelosis in part because one of the senior scientists in, at, um, at Virginia, at the VBI, is uh, a big um, aspergillus guy. So like the world's expert sequence did everything. So he was really interested in looking at, and, and it's of some interest because it's a pretty serious disease, this um, aspergillosis, invasive aspergillosis. I, I did, I'm not going to show you the clinical pictures because they're really cool. Um, but it's caused by inhaling avium goddess, which is everywhere. It is everywhere. Um, and, the, you know, so we're all walking around breathing this stuff. But who gets sick are people who are immunocompromised. So HIV positive, chemotherapy, taking steroids, post-transplant, COPD, severe asthma, all of this, all of these kinds of conditions make you more vulnerable and rate is really pretty significant at 58%. Okay, so, so this is a disease worth understanding. And the key point is really the third one. There's some connection here with the immune system. Okay. Now, iron is an important virulence factor. But here's the good news. Iron regulation in fungi is different from that in the host, eukaryotes. So, so that makes iron regulation a good target. If they operated the same way, and you were gonna target the iron regulation in the, fun, in the fungus, then you're gonna screw up my iron regulation. But they're different, okay? And they have this really cool iron acquisition system, these sideropores that steal the iron from the host. So the plant, would be to target the sideropores. And in fact, there was research that showed in not in mice where the ability to have 
So De La Force um, was, um, was knocked out the, um, in, the, in the fungi, the mice didn't run. So it really does seem to be a good, a good target. So the work in the lab, one of the students, Madison Brandon, was modeling the iron, trying to understand the iron regulatory network in the fungus, a fungus. So she was looking at all the regulatory proteins, the siderophore biosynthesis, and this was her master's thesis that she was, that she was working on. So you get iron, you use up iron, you store iron, you steal iron. Another student was looking at lung epithelial cell and looking at, at how the human immune response works there. So she also, so here's the kind of network that Shanita was working on, and she also had a summer research group for the, this past summer, students working on, on this as well, and I'm not caught up to what they, to what they were doing. But, um, so the Afuma goddess was on Madison's plate, and Shanita was saying, okay, now it's in your lungs, now what's happening? And they were both using the kind of model that I described earlier, both with my XY gene and with the, with the triple. So that's the, this discrete modeling approach that they were taking. A third student, Matt Oremlund, was putting it together in a different way. Now, I have to see if I can make this work. I've got to end this, shrink that, and I've got to bring this up. Okay, so Matt was doing something called agent-based modeling. He took Madison's and Shanita's results together and was looking at what happened. So this is a model of lung, okay? So the red is, is blood vessels, the, the blue stuff here is lung epithelial cells, um, these guys are macrophages, and we're assuming, and the assumption here is this is a neutrophilic individual. So no neutrophils, neutrophils around to help out. You only got them out. So the green stuff is the, is the um, aspergillus. So it's a, it's a really short movie, but he, he's working on trying to make a visual demonstration of how this, how this actually works. So you can see that the, um, there's a lot of hyphenates growing there with, the, with that fungus. That green stuff is growing. And um, the, micro, the macrophages alone don't seem to really be able to, to do the job. So you see what happens with these immunocompromised folks. So those little sort of greenish spheres, those are meant, I had to ask him, he said those are meant to be the, the spores that actually lock in. And uh, there we go. So that's the movie. Back to this. So I I want to introduce you to my partners in crime last year, the Lavenbacher Lab, Shanita Mapp, Reinhardt, who's sitting, Madison. Ani Alfredugo was a uh, postdoc. Um, everybody else there except Reinhardt was the senior scientist for uh, graduate students. And um, we had lab meetings 8 o'clock every Monday morning. And two or three times a semester, we would have potluck breakfast. So this was our last potluck breakfast in, in May. So, thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have, or at least try to, um, and uh, again, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
question in Jennifer with the Boolean model that you described. You're either going to get a steady state of zero or a steady state of some other value, or your only other alternative is oscillation. That's true if you only look at one set at a time. But if, you, if you're looking at, you've got a whole bunch of cells, then with propensities, stochastic propensities to See, turn a bunch on of or cells off, you can average those kinds of things. Hmm? You mean a bunch of, like a population of cells? Yeah, <coughs> yeah. Almost. And with, loaded with these probabilities about whether or not they're going to obey the rules. Now you've got these expected values in between. So your simulation model, was that, you're interpreting that as being what's happening in a population of cells or in a cell? In a population of cells. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you touched on it a little bit, but if you have cells that are asynchronous, um, which is probably what you have if you were working at the college. Yeah. Or the about this problem of asynchronicity and they thought that it might that E. coli um, reproduce so quickly that it might not be an issue. I don't know. That they might be synchronized? Yeah, that they might be effectively synchronized. So I don't know. Um, and if there was no day, no literature on, on this for me to 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 build inches of Mars. So I'm not really sure how to build asynchronicity in, except with these probabilities, this stochastic idea. Yeah, or you could, I mean, yeah, I guess. Uh, you could maybe like assume a flat distribution or something. Yeah. But I mean, it's pretty late, and probably not, you know, there's probably no biology behind that. Yeah. Just uh -huh. um, there, there are quite a bit of data on eukaryotic cells and cell culture, and the effects of stochasticity on Transcription and those systems is one thing that's been coming out of some of that work. Um, you might have isogenic cells that are under critical conditions. Uh, so we start to get divergence in gene expression patterns. And um, that's thought to be due to differences in you know, cell cycle and physiology of the cells. But also, in certain circumstances, if you have very rare transcription factors or something like that, so that you don't have a whole bunch of molecules coming in, things start to have a knowledge. And if you have stochasticity and reaction rates, you can magic certain things. You'll have basically a bimodal distribution where cells are all, you know, have that gene turned off or expressing high levels and things that have the gene turned off expressing very low levels. But, yeah. Oh, we could talk more. Yeah. yeah. I, I certainly think don't claim to know everything about this. I read a lot, but I didn't read read everything. And this is another argument. Okay, so I'm going to preach my sermon again about how mathematicians and biologists need to be talking to each other. There, you know, you as biologists are the ones who really have, in the McClintock phrase, a feeling for the organism. You understand what what's likely to happen, and I really don't. I understand mathematically what's likely to happen. You understand biologically what the expectations are. So um, I am I'm an advocate, advocate for these cross conversations. Yeah. What's your view on that and modeling for biological systems that you can't test? Like they've already always created models for climate change two hundred years from now. Ah. Well, you can't know that. So how do you feel about the
as, a, as an acting practice. So I, I really think that, the, that um, having built the model, the, presumably, you're building the model because somebody asked an interesting biological question. And the person who asked that question was probably a biologist. So you need to be talking to that person. And you say, well, I predict in answer to your question that something or other will happen. And then they say, okay, let's go into the lab and see. <coughs> now, you know, this, this suggests what we ought to measure. And, and now we can look and see that, 